subscribe to the Light Sports and Ultra Light Flyer web video magazine with hundreds and hundreds of videos now online, including air show coverage, Rotax engine tech tips, Rotax 377, 447, 503, 532, and 582 engine rebuilding videos, each two hours in length, propeller maintenance, advisories, and repairs, VRS parachute saves, Bing carb updates, and much, much more. Get a yearly subscription at www.ultralightflyer.com. already done. It does look a little bit similar except it's got that funny little wheel on the back. We didn't see that the other time but um, this is the Cenus now. We looked at the Virus before and yes those terms look like they would be American pronounced differently but this is how we pronounce it. So this is the Cenus. This is a motor glider and you can tell that by its long wings here which your camera can take in from another angle but uh, it's another one of these gorgeous compound wings this is a very accurate way and good way to make something that's made for soaring. That's what this airplane is all about. You, sure, you can go cross country in these too, but the, the magic here is to go up and uh, turn the engine off and see how long you can soar the airplane and enjoy flying that way. And this airplane is particularly well optimized for that. For me, I'm a tail dragger pilot. I like tail draggers, so I'd rather not have that nose wheel up here. I understand that works best for a lot of folks, but the tail wheel on this, I think, gives it a really good look and it's just that much less drag without that thing hanging down here in front of the nose. Now what about the length of the wing here, Dan? This looks to have a, a fairly long wing on it. Well, uh, the Pipistrelle, that's the name of the company that makes this airplane. Uh, they make all those different models we spoke about in addition to a powered uh, sailplane. So they've got quite a variety. This one here is available in three flavors. You can have this 50-foot span, approximately, you have, or you can have a 40-foot span Virus. Or you can have a 34-foot span Virus, which is the Virus SW for short wing. Now this looks like it was another award winner uh, from what I can see on the side. Well, I don't know that it was this particular one, but this company, Pipistrelle, entered into one of NASA's efficiency flight contests. It's got a longer name than that, but that was the idea, and came out the winner. Won a big, fat check, $165,000, I believe, and so that was part of what the Pipistrelle company achieved with a little bit different airplane than this, but essentially this one. And a pretty significant thing that they could win that and win so much money on it. Now, this looks like it's all composite construction. Uh, composite carbon fiber, to be specific. And again, this is one of these products that comes out of Eastern Europe where sailplane building technology has been uh, in progress for decades. And they have clearly got it down very good. And I'm told their factory here is like a hospital, it was described. So clean and tidy and orderly that the kind of construction that you see here has to come out of a facility that's well run like that. Now what are they powering this one with, Dan? Well, as opposed to the one we did before, which was the Virus, and that was the short wing model, that uses the 100 horsepower. This uses the Rotax 80 horsepower. Personally, one of my favorite of the 9, well, it is my favorite of the 912 series. It can use regular automobile gas, not high test, and uh, is just a, they, a little less demanding of the engine, so there tends to be some less problems with that engine because it's not being pushed quite as hard. Now you've got this prop on the front of it, and I saw somebody turning it. I mean, how does that operate? Well, it's pretty normal now. This would be in the uh, powered position, but it can go to a position where there's less drag. That's called a feathered position. And because it's a motor glider, you don't want this big fat blade sticking into the air if you can make it some other way. When we first started with this activity, and a few of the folks that were trying to bring motor gliders into the country said, well, we need to be able to feather the prop. F.A. said, no, 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 that's too complicated. We need you to put all those various things on it so that it just happens. The trouble is those ideas created more complexity, so FAA has reversed their decision now and said, no, the simple method is the good method. And basically what happens here, we'll go look inside the cockpit, there's a big old knob that you pull, that gets it into the feathered position, and to put it, get it back to the powered position, you move the knob back in. If something would happen that's done by a cable, if the cable breaks or something else happens, it returns to the position we see it here in. So it is fail safe, and yet it accomplishes the goal that any motor glider would like to have, motor glider pilot would like to have. Now, let's have a look at the inside, because it looks almost sports car-like in there. It does kind of, and we want to see that big knob. So let's go have a look inside. The two of you look quite comfortable in there. It's nice. Well, of course, we're in a tail dragger. It would be up a little bit more in flight, but boy, it's all reclined back, and these are nice, comfortable seats. It's got some nice leg support here, which I appreciate. If you're going to be in a motor glider. You could be in it for a while on a good day. You could be in it all day because you don't need any engine, so no fuel usage. 
no noise, no vibration. All those good things come with that, but better have some comfortable seats. Fortunately, we do. But the seats don't adjust in this airplane. So how do we compensate for pilots of different sizes? Well, uh, and we're speaking here with Dave Dixon, and he has instructed me that the there's a pin down here. You can see right in front of my finger, there's a small pin down there, and in the rail in, that leads up to it, there's some holes. Now you're only seeing one hole because I suspect that these pedals are back a little further. They look further back than that side does, which your camera probably can't see. So I'm guessing how much movement is there that we can adjust There's about so much movement. Oh, so, so like there, almost there, a foot-like. Yeah. So that's quite a bit now, you know, from, from someone's hips down to their legs. Uh, that's a lot of adjustment. And uh, I, what size pilot can fit in here comfortably? Well, six foot four will fit in here comfortably. Okay. And I've, I've seen uh, some young girls that were probably five foot two. So five two to six four, and you still got enough uh, movement in the pedal yep. range to do that. They were all working well. What kind of control systems are they using? It uh, looks like dual sticks. Dual sticks, uh, also dual rudder pedals on both sides, and uh, tow brakes on both sides, which you can see right here, up here behind my hand. There's the tow brake activator. Looks like a hydraulic system, and on the mains, of course, since it's a tail dragger. Um, but there's another feature that, and this airplane's got some nice. Uh, they're using the Browninger EFIS uh, uh, panel here. You don't need a lot of instrumentation here. Typically, in an aircraft of this type, you'll have an instrument called a variometer which is one that helps you uh, know whether or not you're going up or down when you've uh, got the engine off. And indeed, that's on this side over here. It functions as a variometer, David says. And so that's, to a soaring pilot, that's probably the heart of the airplane when the engine's off. Of course, it's also got some capability to show engine instrumentation as well. Is the airplane equipped with flaps? Yeah. Yes, it is. We've got flaperons, if you notice out on the wing. We've got four positions, two, one, zero and then a negative which is called a reflex position for, for soaring pilots and this gives you more efficiency reflex brings the back end of the uh, the uh, flaps up a little bit not just to neutral but actually raises them which helps the airplane have a little more speed to it it's a function that's common on many european airplanes quite rare on american airplanes uh, but it's called a reflex position. So there's two positions of flap, neutral, and then the one negative or reflex position, which brings those ailerons up. And what's that great big black handle that's between the two of you, Dan? That's the spoilers. And gliders soar so well that you will sometimes gain altitude in the traffic pattern. In the summertime, it's quite common where I live. So we have to use the spoilers to get down. Kind of an air brake. What people see on an airliner when uh, on landing, usually they'll deploy a surface on the top of the wing. What it does is kill lift. This thing is such a long span, it's making lift all the time. These are hard airplanes to get down, which is the idea, of course. They want to stay up. But when it's time to land and you want to get it down, and if it glides so far you can't land it on a normal runway, what do you do? You deploy the spoilers. And that looks like it's full, full deployment, but I'm guessing that you work that when you're coming in and you use it almost like touching the brake a little bit yeah, in a car. Instead of using power like some people do in an, in an approach with an engine, with an aircraft, you use the spoiler to control your rate of descent. It'll go 1,100 feet per minute down or it'll go 200 feet per minute down. That's a lot of change out of those and they're, they're very effective. We'll catch a, catch a camera view of that later. Another important handle up here that's sweet in my mind. This is an emergency parachute system for the whole airframe. Pull that handle once you've removed the safety pin and uh, a rocket motor hauls out the parachute, brings the airplane down to the earth. Hopefully you never need that stuff, but it sure is nice to have it sitting there even if you don't need it. Now, we talk, this is a motor glider, so let's talk a little bit about the performance. What, as an engine on it, what kind of climb rate, what kind of stall speed, and then when you shut it off, what we turn into a glider, what are performance there? So let's take those one at a time. Under power, what's your climb rate? About 1,300 feet a minute. So pretty brisk. That's what the 80 horsepower engine That's you're talking 80 about. Horsepower engine. Again, a function of those big long wings producing all that lift. You don't have to have a huge engine to make it work. Okay, now let's talk about the descent rate, which are sink rate in sailplane terms. Engine off, prop feathered, min minimum rate of descent. What kind of number would you see? With the, about, with the spoilers about, up, of course. About 200 feet per minute. And so a typical airplane, uh, pick any uh, normal powered LSA, pull the engine off, you're going to see 500 maybe, as high as 800, maybe even 1,000 feet per minute with the engine off. Here you've only got 200 feet per minute. 
that's a very slow descent rate. But there's another factor in, in gliders, it's another measurement number that we always use, and that's glide angle. Now, uh, the old benchmark is something like a Cessna 172 that's about nine and a half to one forward for every foot it drops. In this aircraft? 30 to one. 30 to one. So that what that translates to, if you're half mile up, you're only 2,500 feet up, you're gonna be able to go 15 miles before you get to the ground. That's pretty significant. To me, that's a safety factor. It's a big safety factor. Now, we talk about safety, Dan, how many of these airplanes are actually out there, and how many have been produced over the years? Well, Pit is a well-established company. As to the numbers, I'll ask David. Uh, about 300, the uh, latest count. Now, that's of all models, or the Cirrus? No, that's, that's models of this fuselage with, with various wing spans. We talked about the various flavors of span, but so it's all the ones based on this. And then they've got other aircraft, too, yep. for example, the powered sailplane. Yep. And those are about 100. Okay, so the company has produced about 400 airplanes. Yes. Is that right? And they're sold all over the world, um, and uh, the fewest of them probably in the U.S., but guys like David are trying to work to change that. So there's now, one other knob we got to talk about oh in yeah, here, Oh, yeah, that was the one we were playing with the prop on. That's right. There's a couple more down here in the center. They're kind of ordinary things. If I can get my leg out of the way, we've got throttle and choke down here, the usual arrangement of switches and fuses and so forth. But then we got this one, and we talked about that earlier, and I'll let David demonstrate. So pull back, notch it over. Pretty simple. Back the other way, let it go. And again, if the cable breaks, if the cable that does that, it's spring-loaded to the forward position relative to that knob, which puts the prop back in a climb or a power situation as opposed to being uh, fully feathered, which gets the drag down to the minimum. Now, in the United States, how is this airplane coming in? How is it available to the customer? Well, as you see here under my leg, this one says experimental on it. They are working on the SLSA for this. Uh, that's a that's a kind of a long process, and they're not quite done with it yet. Meanwhile, these are sold under the experimental exhibition. Oh, let me correct you that. We, we are now selling them LSA, and we have two in the country that uh, are LSA. We're still working on with the FAA to get the paperwork on them. They're right now in limbo, and that's a problem with all new airplanes, new production. But we'll, get, we'll have that solved in a month. So here we're talking at Sun and Fun uh, 2011. This is the uh, very end of March. So they think, uh, well, let's say before Oshkosh for sure, you should have all that stuff done. Now we're talking SLSA, correct? Yep. Okay. So that'll change. But today, if you wanted to buy this particular airplane, you'd operate it. And this is what David does. And so tell me how this works for you, just so people don't often know about experimental exhibition. That's different than experimental amateur build, because they're not building these. So they come in ready to fly or almost ready to fly out of a container. And uh, so then you have to go through another process. Tell us briefly about what that process is. David. Well, basically the FAA wants to know where their experimental exhibition airplanes are. So we tell them, I send them a fax, I fax a message to them every year that tells where, the, where I'm going. If I go, and that's only more than 300 miles away. Yeah, you said within a 300, so you've got this airport based, uh, this airplane based at your home airport, and all you care about, you're not going to shows, or you don't really care about doing cross country, you just want to go up and catch some thermals and stuff. You have a 300 mile yep. diameter that, uh, a radius, excuse me, a diameter that you can fly your airplane around in? Yes. And for most soaring, that would be more than you needed uh, to have a really nice time with this airplane. But for someone like David, who takes it to air shows, he just applies with the FAA, sends them, notifies them where he's going, and uh, they uh, allow you to go ahead and fly the airplane yeah, around. Yeah, it, it's not a permission thing. We just give it. We give them the information, and uh, they, they know where the aircraft is. So, if we want to get a little more information on this airplane, Dan, where would we go? Well, tell me uh, your web address that they can go get some more information. Well, David. Pipistrelle USA. Okay, and Pipistrelle P I P I S T I R E L. Yes, dash USA. Dash USA dot com. And do you have a flight report on this airplane, Dan? I do have a flight report, and it happened to be on this airplane, not the Virus. I haven't flown that one yet, but I've got one on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com. <laughs>